Beam Project Third Part, Assembly. So a few more parts have come from China and I can already get started. Here are the disc brake adapters. Here are the crimp pliers, clamping the nozzles on the wires. This is a bicycle aluminum alloy seat post. Zoom brand front fork from China. Although this fork is inexpensive about 100 euro. But as it turned out later, it's not a good choice for a beam at all. First of all, it's too stiff, and the hardness adjustment doesn't help much, making it more suitable for driving on asphalt than off-road. In addition, the fork wobbled from the beginning and stuck at all after a couple of months. So I realized that you can't save too much with forks, because later I had to order another, more expensive one. So I started assembling from attaching the fork to the frame. However, it was only after assembling and placing the beam on the wheels, that it became clear that the front fork was moving too much, and that the lower fork bearing bracket included with the frame was not suitable for this fork. So I had to dismantle the fork again, and go to the turner to make a new bracket. Then I assembled the back. It is attached to the frame with one screw. And then the rear shock absorber snaps on, and tightens with two more screws. Then I put in a seat post. But it was a little too long, so I shortened it. I put on the steering wheel and seat. Since my rear motorcycle rim was 19 inches, so I decided to order a 20 inch front bicycle rim. However, it is obvious now, that before ordering the rim I did not know whether the rims of bicycles and motorcycles measured the same. And as it turned out, the rims of a bicycle are measured along with the tire. Therefore, the end result seemed very weird. As a result, the front wheel had to be redesigned, and a 26 inch bicycle rim ordered. By the way, I only chose strong enough bike rims to withstand the weight of beam and off-road challenges. I also attached the brakes and brake discs. Some spaces had to be added to keep the brakes in place. So after a while, I got the front 26-inch bicycle rim and took it to the workshop to redo the front wheel. This time the final picture was much better. In order for the battery to last longer and have less resistance, I ordered dual sport tires. So the bike pedal holder was already built into the frame. So all I had to do was screw in the new single speed crankset with the pedals and put the chain on. As I mentioned earlier I had to order a smaller crankset. The chain was also made in a local bicycle workshop to the required length. Care must also be taken with the cable, as the rear brake disc can damage it, so I tighten the motor power cable with plastic straps, so that it does not touch the brake disc. But when I tried to pedal a bike, it turned out that the rear crankset wheel I got along with the engine was jumping because the teeth were too small. Therefore, it also had to be changed. Applying crankset with larger teeth has significantly improved the situation, although sometimes it jumps anyway, but rarely. I put on mud guards from Fatbike. I then installed the necessary switches, rear view mirror, headlights and handlebars on the steering wheel. I attached a speedometer and voltmeter. I drilled a hole in the plastic and attached the ignition lock. It has three positions, one power off, two accessories on, three controller and accessories on. I drilled and installed the battery charging slot below. Rear light gauge, with turning lights and brake light. 12 amp, 84 volt, charger from China. However, after several charges of the battery, it broke down, so I had to find another charger in my country. And now the most complicated and expensive part of beam is the battery. For a long time, I would consider what to do with the battery, whether to make it yourself or order it. And here I decided not to take risks with Chinese batteries, although they cost less, but there is a lot of uncertainty about their parameters and service life. Therefore, I decided to buy batteries only from a well-known manufacturer, for example Sony, LG, Panasonic, Samsung, in my own country. So it was up to me to decide whether to make it myself or leave it to a professional. After talking to a one specialist and asking for his advice, I decided to try to assemble the battery, by myself. But of course it is quite risky and it is always better to entrust such work to a professional. So I calculated how many batteries should fit in my frame. And that is 240 batteries. So 20 rows long and 2 floors, 6 rows wide, 12 rows in total. I could fit more but it would take the controller to the outside of the frame, but I want everything to fit inside the frame. So 20 rows are needed just to reach 84 volts and 12 rows to raise the amperes and the distance travelled. So if I chose batteries with a 5 amp output, I would only get 5 kilowatt of motor power.
If I chose batteries with an output of 10 amps, it means 10 kilowatt of motor power, but it is always good not to load the batteries to the full 100%, because then they heat up and their lifespan is shortened. So I looked for a more powerful battery and a good price. After a bit of googling I was able to find the Samsung 25R at a good price. These batteries can give up to 20 amps and have a capacity of 2,500 mAh, so a 12-row battery could give up to 240 amps in total and will have a capacity of 30 amps, but the power reserve is always a good thing. At first I decided to buy only a few batteries and with the help of a tester to check if they are original and really have a declared capacity and can deliver 20 amps. After a successful test, I decided to order the rest as well. So since the batteries did not fit in the frame with the holder, all the batteries had to be glued together with hot glue. Then I faced a new problem because nickel welds pulley to each other, and a single layer of nickel plates is not enough for a battery of this big power. There is still the option of soldering the wires to the batteries, but you should be a very good solderer to do this, as heating the battery for too long can cause it to lose its capacity or even explode. So after consulting with a specialist again, I decided to combine both techniques. I first soldered the silicone wires to the nickel plate, Then I welded the nickel plates to the batteries, these jobs have taken quite a bit of time. But with the battery you can't rush, because everything needs to be done right. Then I soldered the outgoing wires from batteries to the larger silicone wires. From now on, I have to be very careful, because touching the battery with wire somewhere can cause a short circuit. So after a couple of days of soldering, the battery was finished. The battery was additionally sealed with heat-resistant scotch insulation tape. Then the battery was wrapped in plastic protection, and wrapped with reinforced scotch tape. Here is a 150 amps BMS battery control unit. It prevents the battery from discharging too much or overcharging, while at the same time balancing the volts between the cells. I moved it outside so I decided that if I wanted more power in the future I could just change the BMS to a more powerful one without having to disassemble the battery. And before assembling the battery, I prepared the drawing so as not to make mistakes during assembly. So the next job was wiring. And there is no rush in this area, before starting work I thought through everything and studied the controller user manual. Fortunately, the manual was written quite clearly, the connection from the motor to the controller was completely suitable. All the necessary connectors for the corresponding controller were added with the controller. Additionally, I only needed a few XT60 connectors. So the positive cable from the battery goes to the ignition switch, then two cables go from the ignition switch, one to the accessories. The second wire goes to the controller. Until the controller receives a signal from this wire it stays at power off state. I connected the accelerator wires. There are three wires, a positive, negative, and a sensor signal. Then I checked with the test of the minimum and maximum voltage in order to enter these numbers in the controller settings for more accurate accelerator operation. I also connected the speed mode toggle button. The speeds are set via the controller applet. These are practically all the necessary connections in order to start using beam. Later I connected reverse gear. Because in off-road, it's pretty useful. All you have to do is connect the negative wire of the battery to the reverse gear switch and then to the one shown in the diagram. I also made an e-brake regeneration button so that I can stop faster if necessary. However, I try to use it rarely because it does not recover much energy, motor heats even more, it does not work while the battery is fully charged. Also the battery charging cycle is limited. So here are my first attempt is to turn on the ignition and make sure everything works. And again, it turned out that the speedometer I ordered does not work with this controller. I had to remove it. But I wasn't very upset, because in off-road isn't really needed, and in the city I can use my phone instead of the speedometer. And this is a USB Bluetooth adapter, with the help of which I can configure the controller directly from my phone. By the way, you need to perform a haul test before driving. I decided not to share the configuration settings of the controller because I don't even know if I set everything correctly. All I can say is that what I did first was adjusting the operation of the accelerator handle. It is possible to configure how much power the engine will receive by what percentage by turning the handle. So with a little twist on the accelerator handle, the beam would do the wheelies. And since I prefer better control, I shifted the power curve to the other side of the handle rotation. And then I thought that was it. Now I can drive. However, unfortunately, some parts did not work as expected, so they had to be replaced. The mudguards appeared too small for off-road, so they had to be redone. 
Much better now. As I mentioned, I was forced to change the front fork as well, so now this DNM fork is really working as expected. I also raised the steering wheel. I changed the seat to a bigger and more comfortable one. I changed the front tire, because the previous one was only good to ride when it's dry, and if it is wet or you're driving through dirt it slips, so I decided to change it. So far so good. The next very important update was the brakes. Because at first I couldn't use all the engine power just because the brakes were too weak. Because cheap Chinese brakes did not work as expected, I chose now between Shimano and Magura brakes. However, I found Magura for a much better price, so I chose them. However, changing the brakes alone was not enough, I also had to change the cheap brake discs to Magura discs. Well then it started braking well, and I was able to use all the power of the engine. As I mentioned earlier I had to change the full twist throttle to the half twist throttle. Because with the full twist throttle riding off road through the bumps, when my hand moves, the bike keeps trying to run away from me. So from my point of view, this is very unsafe. Changing to the half twist throttle solved this problem, as I now hold the steering wheel firmly with three fingers and operate the accelerator with two fingers. I can now control engine power much more precisely. Well and my last update so far is the engine cooler. After driving off-road, I notice that due to frequent acceleration and uphills, the engine starts to heat up. And since I have overheating protection on the controller, I need to stop and cool the engine from time to time. So I decided it was worth buying a radiator to make the engine cooler. And it helps. I didn't film every moment of assembly. So I only added the essential moments, and that's what turned out to be important to me. So that's it. Thanks for watching.